Hello there, and welcome to No Extra Words, One Person Search for a Story. My name is Chris Baker-Dursh. I'm your producer and editor. This is a special episode covering the introduction to The Great American Read on PBS. We're going to talk about what that is and why it matters or doesn't, and my thoughts on the book list and all of that. This doesn't fit in with our usual format, but I spent the better part of my day kind of on and off in between the other things I was trying to do, watching the two-hour PBS special that launched The Great American Read. And when I started, I thought I would have some thoughts on it that I would put on Twitter or or Instagram or something like that. But I very quickly realized I was going to have a lot to say about this project, and it probably merited a special episode. I don't really blog this show in many ways is my audio blog. So when I have this many thoughts on something, I want to come talk to you all about it and and share with you. I'm doing this unscripted off the top of my head just because I wanted to come down and, and talk to you all a little bit about what's going on in the literary world. So for those of you who don't know what The Great American Read is, first of all, I had never heard of it until this week. I'm sure it's something that PBS has been promoting, but I, until I started seeing reactions from people who had watched it and people sharing their votes, I had not heard of it. So what I'm saying is, for those of you who this may be a new thing to you, you're not alone. The Great American Read is a PBS program in conjunction with several organizations. I know the American Bookseller Association is involved. I know the American Library Association is involved. Um to help Americans choose America's best loved novel is kind of the premise of this. So it was launched this week with a two hour PBS special that introduced a hundred books. So these are the nominees for this project. And according to PBS, they did a survey of 7,000 Americans from various demographics and regions and whatever, and ask them about their favorite books and based on what favorite novels. I'm going to be really careful to use the word novel when I talk about this, because this is part of what I'm going to go into a little bit later about my feelings on this project, is the host, Meredith Vera, of the special kind of used the word book and novel interchangeably. And to me, it's interesting the program is called The Great American Read and not The Great American Novel. So favorite novels, based on the responses of these 7,000 Americans, they came up with a list of America's 100 favorite novels. And they're asking you, as Americans, I know not everyone who listens to this is in America, but asking Americans to vote on their favorite. And in the fall, they will come back with a final special that will introduce you to America's favorite novel. So that's the premise of the project. I have some opinions on this, as I'm sure you can tell. It would be very easy (laughs) to just start hating on this. And I think that's what we do in this culture, right? If somebody comes with an idea, somebody does something, and the first thing we do is we poke holes in it and we trash it. And I don't necessarily, that's not why I came on here, is I don't necessarily want to do that. Um, I want to share my opinions about this, but... um, I want to make sure that I, that more than anything, this is a literary moment that is happening. It's big enough now that I've seen it, that at least book people, now I don't know about the broader culture, but book people are talking about it. So I don't want to trash it. I don't want to do anything like that. I just want to share with you my honest thoughts. So I want to start by telling you what I really like about what they're doing. First of all, I really love it when people talk about their favorite books. Even when people talk about books that I hate, that they love. That makes me happy because I like that a book touches someone, even if it doesn't happen to be me. The book that I've covered, so since we started season two, for those of you who may be jumping on this show, what season two is, is we take two books, pair them up together, and talk about them and how they 
interact with each other. And these can be two similar books, two wildly divergent books, and it's usually stuff that I like because it's my show and I spend the time putting it together. But the book that I would say of all the things that we've covered so far in season two, the book that I have really trashed on is The Velveteen Rabbit. I have no love lost for The Velveteen Rabbit. And if you're curious about why, you can go back and listen. That's episode 104, A Tale of Two Toy Bunnies. It's just not my cup of tea. But a lot of people love The Velveteen Rabbit. And I like hearing them talk about why. And I like hearing them tell me how this book had an impact on them. And that's something that I, as a librarian, work really hard to do is... I try not to let my own opinions about books shut other people down in telling me about them. Um, I was a school librarian for years, and I would never start a conversation with a kid about a book telling them that I didn't like it or that it wasn't my favorite. If asked directly, I might say, oh, I tried it, but it was the wrong time. Or, you know, I don't read too much of that kind of book. It's just not really my thing, but I should try it again. Just kind of keeping it even keel because I wanted the kids to have the freedom to tell me what they thought of their favorite books and to not feel like they were going to get judged for loving something that I hate because reading is so intensely personal. And that's part of what I want to talk about today is It's such a personal consumption of art. And I think more than a lot of other art that we consume in this culture, reading is a very one-on-one experience. It's the interaction of reader with book. That's why when I, when I brought in the focus of this show and changed the subtitle, I really made it one person search for story because that journey into story with literature is such an individual experience and such a personal taste thing. And all art is, but When you, for example, watch a movie, oftentimes you do that with someone. You know, when you watch TV shows, you might be doing it alone, but there's a long tradition of us all kind of crowding around TV sets together as a family or as a group of friends to watch TV together. When you're looking at visual art, you're often doing it in a gallery or a museum where there's this interaction with the people around you. And so a lot of those forms of art are very communal. When you hear music, that's usually done in a concert setting where you have this audience experience. And that's awesome. I love all of those forms of art. Reading and literature is intensely personal. You know, yes, we have book groups and we have, you know, online discussion forums. And I'm having a lot of fun on Goodreads and some of those platforms where I get to interact with other readers. That's great. But when I'm in a book in that moment, it's really just a one-on-one experience with me and book. And I think that's one of the reasons that the personal taste thing is such a big deal, is that a book that can have a gigantic impact on me might not hit the next 10 people in the same way. And so as a librarian, I take my responsibility to not start a conversation with an intensely positive or intensely negative perspective on a book because it doesn't leave room for the other person. The great Nancy Pearl, rock star librarian, I took a class from her on Reader's Advisory when I was in graduate school. And one of the things she talked about was how to run a good book group. And she said the number one mistake she feels like a lot of book group facilitators make is they start the conversation with, you know, you've got your group of friends sitting around, they have their tea, they have their beer, whatever, they're talking about the book. And the very first thing that they say is, so what'd you guys think of the book? And she said, that can really backfire because suddenly it turns everything into a positive or negative, and it feels like people who are taking the sort of minority point of view feel like they can't speak. Whereas if your first question is something like, why do you think main character X makes this choice that launches the action? Anybody can answer that and give, and that's an opinion question. So it's not a yes or no, it's not a reading comprehension. It's definitely a book group kind of a question. But whether you loved or hated the book, you can participate in that conversation. And that can lead to more leading questions like that, where you're talking about motivation and setting and character and all those things. And then once you've done that, and once everybody's kind of talked through how they sort of saw this book unfold, then as you get to your end of your book group, 
as you get to your last couple of questions, then you say, so what did everybody think of the book? Because by that time, everyone's had a chance to kind of express their thoughts about something and have a chance to interact with this literature. And then you can introduce the positive or negative. There's nothing wrong with the positive or negative. But by that time, you're comfortable speaking the language of this book, and it doesn't shut conversation down. So one big thing about this particular journey, The Great American Read, is I love hearing people talk about why they love books. And that's really what this two hour special, it's fully available online, you can watch it at the PBS website, I'll put a link in the show notes. That's really what it is, is they work their way through these 100 books with different people, many of them celebrities, but some of them everyday man on the street folks, telling you why they like this book and why you should read this book. And that is fun. I'll be honest, two hours straight of that is a lot. So there's kind of a reason that I broke up my watching of this just a little bit. But, you know, there are books on that list that I have never tried. There are books on that list that I have no intention of trying. There are books on the list that I adore. And there are books on the list that I can't stand. And I think that's probably true. We'll get a little more into the list in a little bit. But I think that's probably true of pretty much any well read person who approaches this list is you're going to have the same kind of reaction and be like, yeah, I wouldn't touch that one with a 10 foot pole. Oh my gosh, that was my favorite book in the world. And what were they thinking? I couldn't finish that one. Very normal reaction. But to see different people kind of making the pitch for their book was really fun. I really like the depth and breadth that the list has, which is one of the things that it's being critiqued about is this sort of pop culture feel to it. It has a lot of more contemporary titles, more trendy titles. And I think there are people who look down on the list. But I like that it has a pretty good depth to it. Now, I was curious. So I did some numbers. And this is just entirely based on my quick read of the list and making tally marks. So please don't like carve these numbers into stone. But I was just curious how the list broke down. So I kind of made a little a little chart for myself. Um, there's, so there's 100 books on the list total. About 75% of them have been published since World War II, which is, I think, to be expected of a list like this. I think really what we need to think about this as is more than anything, it's kind of a popularity contest for books. That That's how it's set up. And so I think thinking of it that way helps put the list in context. And that would make sense why most books are more modern on the list, because a lot of people don't read as much from sort of that pre mid 20th century range. So about 75% of the books are post World War Two, that means about 25% of the books are pre World War Two. Um, about a third of the books were written by women, about 10% were written by people of color. Um, of that number, about half of those are African American, and there are some other ethnic groups represented in there as well. So, about 5% of the total are written by African Americans. About 5% of the total are written by women of color. And about 10% of the list was books published for children or young adults, which was kind of refreshingly surprising to me. As soon as I saw that they were creating a, a canon of, you know, America's favorite novels, I immediately thought, well, it's not going to have Charlotte's Web on it. So I immediately have to take it off the list. Like if it does have some of those iconic um, juvenile or young adult titles on it, then I have to discount it immediately. And it does have Charlotte's Web on it. So there you go. Those numbers do not speak to as much diversity as one could perhaps dream of, um, which is not surprising given because in order for a book to make this list, it has to be sort of mainstream published and, and popular and just the barriers that are in place to women and people of color achieving that level, um, especially through history, is going to automatically bias the list towards white men. So I think there was some intentionality done to making sure that it was not white men dominated. And the other thing that I appreciated that I was surprised by is as soon as I saw the title, I immediately thought these were going to be American published books only, but they're not. Um, there are translations on there. There are books originally published overseas, including in England and other places. Um, 
which is nice and refreshing. One thing I did notice is the LGBTQ representation list is tiny. I think I only saw one, maybe two. So that's a voice that's not widely included in this list. Again, not incredibly surprising when you're talking about something that's supposed to like represent the canon of all literature, but definitely a, a hole, a, a gap in the list. So I was impressed. I mean, it has a lot on it. There's a book by Frank Peretti on it. The Shack is on it. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey is on it. Harry Potter is on it. And so is Great Expectations and Pilgrim's Progress and To Kill a Mockingbird. And it's a very interesting list. And I do believe them that they chose it by survey of Americans. I definitely think this is a book popularity contest, but I'm sure there was some editorial oversight given there as well, just to make sure that some of those voices got bumped up a little bit to make sure they're included. And I don't, that's not a criticism. I think that's okay. So there's a lot going for this project. And I like the community cooperation. They're really encouraging an online conversation as well as an in-person conversation. If you hang around in bookish spaces, I bet you're probably already starting to see displays of this in your libraries, in your bookstores. And this is a great time of year for that because libraries and bookstores gear up to do summer reading. And summer reading is a program that's well established for children. And I can and will talk about that some other time, the reason why that's so important and the reason why so many of our resources go into that. Um, helping to support children's literacy in the summer is a vital part of what these spaces do. But everybody always wants to include adults, and it's difficult to figure out how to do that. So the timing of this stacks up really nicely for those community spaces where books are. And I like that aspect of it. I think the website's really nice. You can go on and share a story about a book that's impacted your life and I, a novel. Again, I have to be careful with my terminology because I'm getting to that in a minute. Um, a novel that's impacted your life. And I'm fairly certain based on my read of the website that the novel does not have to be from the list. That then that would be, I think, your space if your favorite novel's not on there to kind of make a pitch for it. It's not going to be in the running because the voting is only on this these hundred books, but to make your pitch for why your favorite novel is something that should be read and, and has changed your life. There's, there's room for that as well, which I really, really like. So I think the project has a whole lot going for it. And I love anything that gets the culture talking about literature and that gets the culture talking about books and reading. I appreciate seeing the famous people who were covered um, on the special included, I didn't see any politicians specifically, which I thought was really interesting. That That's not true. I think Paul Ryan is on there. But I, what I saw was like Chelsea Clinton and the Bush daughters and so sort of families of politicians are there. Um, musicians, actors, intellectuals. I think there's an astronaut. Neil deGrasse Tyson's on there. Um and certainly authors are well represented and then a lot of men on the street people. It sort of started to feel like the living, breathing video version of, do you remember those? Remember, they're still out. Those read posters that would have a picture of a famous person and it would say read and they would be holding their favorite book um, just to encourage kids especially, to see famous people interacting with literature. Um, those have been around for a while. I think you can even buy from the company that makes them software. I've seen it advertised. So like if you're a school, you can have a read poster made of your principal holding up their favorite children's book. And that's something that's very common in schools that I'll see is they'll have teachers post on their door what they're reading so that students can see what the teachers, faculty, and staff of the schools are reading which I think is great. The more you can show people that are looked up to interacting with and appreciating literature, the better. That makes a fantastic example. Um, so there's a lot going for this. And I was a little riled up when I first kind of saw it come forward because, because of what I'm about to talk about. But um, I appreciate the thoughtfulness behind this. And I appreciate that it's happening. And I'm going to be excited to be watching. Um, 
I'm going to say at the end what I think my role is going to be in this summer's journey. But before I do that, I do want to share with you my kind of reservations about a project like this and why I wish it had been done differently. First of all, I think there's something incredibly limiting about sticking with novels. I think part of the goal here is to get people interested in reading and talking about reading who don't define themselves as readers. And that is a great goal, and I'm all for it. But I don't necessarily think all of those people are necessarily going to be novel readers. We live in a time of really amazing nonfiction. We live in a time of really incredible memoir. We live in a time of very, very interesting, well-researched, readable history. We live in a time of a great amount of stuff that is out that is not novel. Um, Graphic novels have exploded and are incredible. And I don't, I didn't see a graphic novel on this list. I don't know if they would count. Um, And so I hear a lot from people I don't read. That's something that I hear, you know, I tell them I'm a librarian. I tell them that I, you know, have a podcast about books and I hear, oh, I don't read. And then I hear that they've been hugely impacted by a self-help book or a book of essays or a book they read their kid or and that somehow those kinds of books are seen as not reading. Oh, I didn't really read it because I read it on my Kindle and it was just, you know, Cheryl Strayed or it was just... I'm trying to think off the top of my head of some of the trendier self-help books and I'm drawing a blank, but I will get, it was just that. And I, you know, so I don't really read. Well, that is absolutely 100% reading and it's being left out of this conversation, which I think is unfortunate. So in the first half of the show was I was trying to be really intentional and use novel instead of book. It's because that's what they have chosen. And I really wish they had been honest in their advertising and called this the Great American Novel rather than the Great American Read, because it's not being inclusive of all of those forms of reading. And that's not necessarily on its face a bad thing. The search for the Great American Novel is not new, but there is this history in literature of hierarchy, of sort of novels being the top, you know, the sort of literary novel being the cream of the crop, and then other things kind of line up below that, which doesn't reflect book sales. It doesn't reflect tastes. And I'm not even necessarily 100% sure it reflects quality. So that is problematic when you're really trying to encourage a diversity of reading to automatically limit it to a form that has already been sort of elevated to what the educated people do, if you will, what the people with leisure time do. Um, that is something that gave me a little bit of heartburn. I do appreciate that there are children's books represented, and that was surprising to me because those are things that also often get dumped down the hierarchy. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if the winner was one of those children's books because the children's books that are on there are iconic. Um, the Giver by Lois Lowry is one of them. Harry Potter, of course. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is there. The Little Prince is there. Where the Fern Grows. Charlotte's Web. So these are touchstone books in terms of juvenile publishing. And I'm glad that they're included because juvenile publishing does get downgraded. I have been reading, and I've been talking about this everywhere. You're probably sick of hearing this, but I have been reading the fabulous Dear Genius, The Collected Letters of Ursula Nordstrom. You have heard me talk about Ursula Nordstrom before. Ursula Nordstrom is that legendary children's book editor at Harper and Row in the middle 20th century. And her collected correspondence between writers and illustrators of all stripes, as well as readers and librarians, and everybody is collected in this book. It's amazing. And there's a story she wrote in one of her letters. It may have been to Minor Dijon, or it may have been to E.B. White. I can't remember. 
where she talks about how she was offered at one point the chance to be the director of the adult department. And it was presented to her as sort of this, well, you've done such a good job producing children's books. Maybe it's time to get promoted to like work with the adult stuff. And she said she pretty much laughed in, in their faces and said she wasn't interested in, in producing books for adults because they're not that interesting. So I appreciate that children's books did make the cut, but there's still an entire swath of literature being left out of the conversation here. Now, Having said that, I can appreciate why it would be very difficult to broaden an experiment like this to include every book written. <laughs> and so limiting it to novels does, in logistical terms, make sense. Which leads me to my second big issue with this, and that is that why does it have to be a competition? I love the idea of bringing books to light and letting, giving a platform in which everybody from the very famous people to everyday people can speak passionately about their favorite book. I love that. I don't understand why that has to turn into finding the best. I do understand that culling lists of books and, and sort of bringing forward the best ones is part of the journey of literature. That's why literary awards exist. And that's wonderful. And I'm a librarian and we do this. We make book lists. We choose books that we showcase for display or that we do what we call a book talk, which is basically us giving a little mini commercial on one. You know, we, we choose intentionally because we can't promote everything. But we don't try to limit it that far down. And when we do, I think we do to our peril. Because only one of these books is going to quote unquote win. And it just feels like when you talk about America's favorite novel, I mean, my favorite novel can be dramatically different from your favorite novel. And that's a good thing. And so trying to take this complicated culture that's been around for several hundred years and has produced this amazing canon of literature and this wonderfully diverse, rich group of people and try to get them to pick one book just seems kind of crazy to me. I mean, I don't answer the question, what is your favorite book? Well, when people are talking to just me. It's not a question I particularly like because, you know, it immediately comes to my mind, my favorite book of what? You know, my favorite book that I read as a child, my favorite book that I've read in the last year, my favorite book to read with my kid, my favorite book to use at work, my favorite book to talk about and promote, my, um, any of those things. Um, all of those may have multiple answers, but certainly none of those questions is answered with the same book. And so trying to limit, I just get really antsy when anything limits what people are reading and enjoying. It just starts to bother me a little bit. And then you also have that problem of you're talking about, you know, the earliest books on this list are 16th century. You're talking about 500 years of books. <laughs> You do run into that problem of, you know, how do you compare baseball players that played in different decades? How, how do you compare Babe Ruth with Cal Ripken? You know, like, how, how do you even do that? It's a different, it's an entirely different thing. And you run into that problem with, you know, you can't compare Babe Ruth really with anybody because there's a whole segment of the population that isn't allowed to play with Babe Ruth. That's not true now. Like, I have a somewhere in the house, I have a Sports Illustrated magazine that tried to list the top 50 baseball teams of all time in Major League Baseball. A really impossible task to do, but it's sort of like, well, anybody pre-1947, I don't want to hear about because the Newark Eagles of the Negro National League by default can't make that list. And so it's an irrelevant list. And so... 
you run into the same problem of, of where do you put and the, the show you see the show struggle with this a little bit in in the in the Great American Read special, like, especially when they're talking about like Gone with the Wind, you know, here's a book that is a touchstone still in American culture. It's, you know, that book is 80 some odd years old. And it's still very resonant with a huge chunk of the population. How do you read it and respect its place in American culture while still acknowledging how problematic it really is to a gigantic segment of the population? And books that I think might have been on that list if it had been released a year ago, I, you know, a year, 18 months ago, I would have been really surprised to see a list like that come out without Sherman Alexie's The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian on it. And I don't want to talk about Sherman Alexi. I really don't right now. But he is not on this list, and I'm not surprised. But, you know, it's sort of like some of the problematic books are on there and some are not, entirely depending on why they're problematic and the timing. And so it just becomes this, I feel like in some ways, as, as ambitious and wonderful as this project is, and I'm glad that it exists, I wish I wish it could have been done in a different way. Because it feels limiting right from the start. Like I say, maybe some of you heard about this before it went live, but I feel like the first time it was introduced to me, it was in the context of, hey, vote for your favorite book of all time. Here are your hundred choices. It's like, well, you've already sort of cut me off at the knees because you've already culled this list for me from which I might choose. And as much as I might like the list, I don't like that feeling. And I feel like maybe there was a way to start a literary conversation from a more broad-based perspective. Maybe there's not. I don't know. I'm not a PBS producer. Maybe what they did is exactly what they needed to do. But that's why I wanted to come on and talk to you on mic, because I, I want to challenge this notion that somehow there are book people out there who get to decide what's good and what's not. And I'm one of them, so I don't want them to exist. And the other thing is, as I've said a couple of times now, this is a popularity contest for books. That's really all it is. And books don't work that way, especially not now. Because we live in an era of very, very, very niche publishing. And that's awesome. Because there are boutique publishers and indie published authors out there that can give you exactly what you need. Now, in some ways, that's annoying. Because in some ways, I think there's some validity to the criticism that maybe there's too many books coming out right now. But... There are segments of the population that are never going to win a popularity contest that are seeing themselves be represented in literature. I was reading something the other day about how the, the portrayal of non-binary and asexual characters is still minuscule in mainstream literature. But there are book lists now of authors, a lot of them indie published, who are publishing books that are hitting that market of people who really need and deserve to see themselves in print. And the show also touches on that, touches on how important representation is and how important it is for people to see themselves in literature. But some of those niche books are never going to make a top 100 list ever, but they may change the lives of someone who does find them. And that is why I don't think books should be judged on their popularity. I think they should be judged on whose lives they touch. And if, if they're touching lives out there, then that's a great thing. And then, of course, the other problem is the great American novel could be written tomorrow or might have been published last week. Any time you try to capture something like this, you're leaving out the now of literature. And that's probably okay, because there are awards out there that are designed to capture the now of literature. There's the National Book Award, there's the Pulitzer, there's the, you know, awards that are given to a book published in a current year. So it's probably okay that a conversation like that sleeves out all of those and really focuses on what we in the library world call the backlist. Um, but the other thing is, in order to make this list, a book by default has to be in print. So it has to have maintained its popularity to the point where it's been around long enough to have a big enough audience to make it to this list. And 
has to be popular through a time span enough to still be in print. Which, again, for a popularity contest for books, probably works. A personal note of bias? There are several authors on this list who the book they are nominated for is not my favorite by them, and I don't think represents their best, but probably represents their most popular. Um, the big example of that for me is John Green. I don't like looking for Alaska. I've never liked looking for Alaska. I find that book kind of annoying. There are two John Green books that I recommend to everyone I talk to. One of them is An Abundance of Catherines, which is just a fantastic book. It's about a, a teenager who's been dumped like 17 times all by girls named Catherine. So he goes in search of a mathematical formula to determine why Catherines always dump him. So already the premise of this book is so much better than looking for Alaska. The other John Green book that I recommend to everybody is Will Grayson, Will Grayson. That's the book that I buy like for everybody's birthday. And what's great about that book is it sort of takes some of the John Green out of John Green. Because it's co-written by John Green and David Levithan, who is truly one of the most wonderful people ever. Um, John Green is great, but he does need sort of his edges rubbed off a little bit sometimes. And Will Grayson, Will Grayson does that. It's about two characters, both named Will Grayson, who randomly encounter each other's lives. And it's wonderful. So I... You know, I'm, I'm just, for me personally, again, this is so much a taste thing. For me personally, if I was reading a John Green book for the first time, Looking for Alaska is not what I'd pick. If I was reading my first ever Toni Morrison, Beloved is not what I would pick. Because that's a really, really, really hard book to read. I've never been able to make it through it. And I think for people who love Beloved, that's what they love about it, is that it's really, really, really hard to get through. And it's sort of complexity and richness and toughness is what makes it it. Which is awesome if that's your thing. But if that's not your thing, for the love of God, please read Song of Solomon. Um, and so that's the other thing is I think a lot of these books, not all, but a lot of them are tough reads. They're very literary. They're very pithy. They're very wordtastic is <laughs> not a word. But as with most book lists put together by book people, there's a really heavy bias towards the literary here. And that again, is going to make this contest unapproachable for a lot of readers, especially if they feel like they have to make a good chunk of reading 100 books. Now, here is my stats on this. I am a librarian. I've not spent a ton of my life as an adult services librarian. So adult books have not always been my my space. I read I read a lot of them and I enjoy them, but it's not always kind of my primary thing. So and only 10% of this list is is children's and YA. But um I ran the list and again this was a very, very quick check mark thing. So I may have missed a couple. But what I counted for myself is of the 100, 37 of these I've either read or read enough of them to know I'm not gonna read them. So there's definitely some abandoned titles on here from my perspective. Most of the ones I've not read, it's intentional. Um, there are several on there that it's knowing I know enough about them to know that they're not going to make it to my to be read list. They're just not. They're not going to be my thing. I'm not interested. And I'm not going to let this list of 100 books change my mind on that. I rarely, you know, when you see those quizzes go by on Facebook, how well read are you? How many of these hundred books The Guardian says you should have read by 35 have you read? I rarely crack 50% and it doesn't bother me. Um, so I, what I don't want people to do is to approach this list and think, oh my God, like I'm the worst person ever. What have I been reading? Because I've missed all these books. I think one of my goals for the summer, what I'm going to do with this list if I get around to it, is I would like to go through it and use it to update my Goodreads because these books are going to be part of the literary conversation and I like being part of the literary conversation. So to do ratings and reviews of the ones that I have read or have abandoned. And then there's probably a good half a dozen on that list that should be on my to-be-read list. And I do want to update those because there are several that I have missed. There's nothing on there that came as a shock. There's nothing on there that was like, oh, why have I never heard of this? But there are definitely some on there that are like, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to get to that one for a long, long time. A library confession, I've never read 1984. I keep meaning to. I know it's not that difficult to read. 
it's been something I've aspired to do. It's just never cracked the top of my to be read list. So if you've got something like that, that's your like deep, dark secret as a reader, it's okay. You're among friends, pull up a chair. It's cool. Um, so I do want to use it in that way. The list. In terms of what I'm voting for, this librarian abstains. I'm not against the voting. I think y'all should go out there and vote. And if something on this list is your favorite novel in the world, yeah, by all means, push it forward. But I know I'm taking this too seriously. I know that. You don't have to tell me I'm aware. But I myself can't bring myself to vote for to pick a favorite or to even pick a half a dozen favorites off this list. I just think there's there's not enough right with the way this is happening for me to want to be a voter in it. What would I vote for if I were going to vote? I have no idea. Charlotte's Web is up there. Um, Alice in Wonderland is up there. The funny thing is, Alice in Wonderland is a children's book that I never think of as a children's book. I remember... When I was in an AP English class in high school, I was supposed to write a novel study analyzing the language of a book, and Alice in Wonderland was my first choice. And I presented the idea to my English teacher. He was like, that sounds like an interesting project. Go with it. And realized it was way too difficult and ended up going with James Baldwin's If Beale Street Could Talk, which is a fabulous book and not the James Baldwin book that makes this list. So what would I vote for if I were going to vote? No idea. But I do want to make a prediction because they're fun and because what have I got to lose? As I said earlier, I wouldn't be surprised if one of the children's books won. There are certainly, I think, high contenders and low contenders. Um, I think certainly some of the more popular stuff among this list, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, would be more likely to take the top slot. But I do want to make a prediction. And I basing this just entirely on what I think the population who's going to be attracted to this contest is going to do. But I'm going to make a prediction for what I think the winner is going to be, because I want it on the record. I think the winner of The Great American Read is going to be To Kill a Mockingbird. Which is great. That's a fabulous book. If you haven't read it, you should go read it. Scout Finch is one of the most memorable characters in all of literature. I'm not going to vote for all the reasons that I said, but that is the prediction that I'm going to make right here, right now. Those are my thoughts on The Great American Read. I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear how this is affecting your summer reading plans or not. Um, I would love to hear who you're voting for or not. I just... I'm really, I am going to be an observer of this process for sure, because I'm not participating, but I definitely want to see and know how it all plays out. I'm super intrigued by whether this is going to meet any of what I'm sure our PBS and the American Bookseller Association and the ALA's goal about increasing reading and, you know, increasing the cultural conversation. And there's this idea of creating a canon of literature that people should read is not new and it's not even bad necessarily. It's just, it's just hard and it's fraught and it's the reason that ninth graders have to suffer through Beowulf and not enough people have read their eyes or watching God. By the way, there's one thing this list has pointed out to me. It's that I am way overdue for a reread of their eyes were watching God, which is a book that I just love, love. Um, that creating of a canon, though, it always results in putting things in that you wonder why they're in and leaving things out that never should have been left out. And I guess I just needed to come on microphone and spend 45 minutes telling you who, being the person who told you that. Um, we are coming out with our third anniversary episode on Tuesday. It's interesting timing when paired with this because it features a decidedly mediocre book that had a huge impact on my life, as well as a children's classic that followed it. It's two girls named Betsy, and that should be out on Tuesday. And at the end of that episode, I'm going to launch our own summer reading series. I 
I'm doing something special with a favorite book series of mine over the course of this summer and encouraging you to dip in, you dip your toes into what were life changing books for me. And I'm not even going to tell you whether or not they made this list. I'm going to let you make you wait and see. Thank you so much for listening to this special episode. I hope you'll stay in touch and connect. I am noextrawords.wordpress.com and I am at noextrawords on Twitter and Instagram and love to connect with you and talk about books and stories. So stay tuned for our new next episode on Tuesday. And it's been a delight coming on to rant with you guys about all things books. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>